Well, hallelujah. It's good to be in God's house and even better to serve the Lord. Amen. Um, and these days that we live in, of course, we're not going to live in any other days than these days that we live in. But this is the day that the Lord has made for us and for us to uh, acknowledge him and praise him and worship him. And uh, he's just a wonderful, wonderful God. Well, if you open up your bulletins, you'll see the title, A Flea in Jesus. Now, if you start itching, there might be some fleas jumping on you. I don't know. But it's in uh, Matthew 9, 27 through 29. Um, Pastor Dave Amsetz, would you come up and read that message, that passage? You bet. You bet. Matthew 9, 27. Yes, sir. And through 29. 27 to 29. Everybody there? Jesus heals the blind and mute. As Jesus went on from there, two blind men followed him calling out, Have mercy on us, son of David. And when he'd gone indoors, the blind men came to him and he asked them, Do you believe that I'm able to do this? Yes, Lord, they replied. Then he touched their eyes and he said, According to your faith, it'll be done to you. According to what? Your faith. Your faith. Well, I want uh, Caden to come up here. And I'm going to ask Caden to, to pray and then we'll... I'll get into the message. Go ahead. Dear God, he rejoice because mm -hmm. our God is sovereign and he is good. He's precious. Lord, you set us free so we can rejoice in your presence in this place as a community. And Father, we believe on this cornerstone who died for our sins and who made us whole. Father, we are just so, so thankful for who you are, for what you've done. Amen. How magnificent it is to have a God like you. Yes. Oh, God, I thank you for your reality, Lord, that you can reveal yourself so, so holy, Lord, where there's, there's not a shred of doubt, because we know that the Lord has shown up and the Lord has moved. God, I pray that this service would be packed with your presence, Lord, that it would be so powerful in this place. Pray a blessing for Bishop Ron as he gives us word, that it would be able to minister to us and change our hearts, Lord. Lord, let us grow in this place and with you, God, as we are taught by the words that Bishop Ron has for us. Amen. 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 Okay, stay right up here because I want you to be a witness to something. You know, uh, if you take a jar like I have here, and of course I have this mason jar with the lid on it, and you put and deposit some fleas in this jar. Now, these fleas will jump up, and I have one in this jar, by the way, right now. But if you deposit fleas in here, they'll jump up and keep hitting this lid. Well, after three days, they're conditioned. And you can take this lid off, and those fleas won't jump any higher than where this lid is, the height of this lid. If you had a, another jar that was this tall with a lid on it, they'd jump up to there. You know, fleas can really jump far. If you don't believe me, get a couple of dogs and see. <laughs> I'm using this as a metaphor, and I've had this lid on here with this flea in here for three days. I'm going to take it off. Now, Caden, I want you to, do you see it? Do you see that flea in there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. He's my witness. All right, we're going to take the lid off. There's that little burger right there. I don't want to get close. Okay, we'll leave it right here. He won't jump out of there. Even if there's a dog, even if there's a dog laying over here, right? So you can go ahead and put the mic up. Oh, over here. Okay. 
Thank you, Katie, for the prayer, and thank you for being a witness. Did you know that when they have their offspring, their offspring won't jump any higher than that lid? Now, I find that kind of interesting, but I'm using it as a metaphor for our lives. Who put a lid on you? Who told you that you can't jump higher than what people say that, that where you're at? Are you with me? The difference between us and this flea is that, well, we have redeeming values in our lives, which I would say, and we know that it's the blood of Christ. And also, along with that, we have free will. Now, here's the sad thing, and I'm talking about us saints that are in this room today. Christ came and took the lid off of our lives. But yet, Christ is saying, come up higher. And we still are only jumping to where that, the lid's not there anymore. But we're only allowing our faith to come up to that lid. You know, the lid of our lives that's been placed on us are limitations. You know, faith doesn't have any limitations. That's why Christ put a picture. See, I love, I love the words of Christ because he's always painting pictures and you can get a lot of meaning out of pictures. That's why Donna and I on many, many, many occasions, we'll take a drive and what our big hobby that we like to do is we like to go to art galleries and, I, and we've bought a lot of paintings over the years but they have to have a meaning to it. I don't buy an abstract painting. <laughs> it has no meaning to me. It might be interesting to look at, but it doesn't have any purpose, doesn't have any meaning. So we've got plenty of paintings, and some of them even in storage we hadn't even framed yet. But I'll find the history behind that painting, and Donna and I, and then if that history of that painting, I want to know why the artist painted. And I'm going to share a story with you. And some of you know this gentleman. He's a famous artist here. He used to be a member of this church. He lives down in San Antonio area now. His name is Jerry Rufin. And he's very famous. Lady Bird Johnson put him on the map. Lady Bird bought all of his paintings in, uh, in uh, Texas landscape. If you remember, some of you that are old enough to remember, Lady Bird had a bunch of banks all over the hill country here. I think she had like 10 or 12 banks. And what she did, she, had, she commissioned Jerry Rufin, and he would make these huge portraits. And she was putting these in her banks, and that's how he got his name out there. And he be, he's in the Texas Hall of Fame of, of talent or, or of artist. One day, he was driving down the road, and he, he's a Christian. He loves the Lord. He felt like God told him to stop, and, he wanted, and the Lord was telling him to paint this scene. It was right at where the sun was going down. And it was a road with a big plaque there that said the, you know, R&J Ranch or something to that nature. So he took a picture of it and then he painted it. So he put this painting in an art gallery for sale in Marble Falls. Now I'm gonna show you how God can move and how tender and how our own God uses a variety of ways to break through the lid of our lives. So there was a lady, very prominent looking, that came into the art gallery and just loved this painting and asked the art person, the owner, if she could take it home for a few days to let her husband look at it to see if she could get permission to buy it. It was quite expensive. The roofing, the roofing paintings are very expensive. I mean, you're not going to go in and, and he has no prints. 
He has originals, and that's all he does. Well, the art owner called Jerry Rufin, and he said, okay, I'll, okay, I'll allow him to do it. And she took it home. So after about four weeks or five weeks, the lady hadn't brought it back, hadn't gotten any word, so Jerry called and said, hey, what about, <laughs> what about this painting? This lady was only going to keep a few days. So she called him, called her, and told her, hey, you got, you got to make a decision. Well, her husband was in depression and had been in depression for a little bit over a year. And the reason why his son, his best buddy, his best friend, they did everything together. He died in a car accident that he was driving. He was around 22 or something like that. They did everything together. They fished together. They hunted together. Well, she got up enough nerve to go in to talk to him because he would come in from work and just sit in the chair and mope and turn all the lights off. You think God cares? See, there was a lid on his life because his son died. And somebody had to help him to know that you can come up out of that jar. You don't have to stay there. Well, his wife finally got up enough nerve and she brought the painting to him and said, you know, honey, I've had this now for several weeks and they, we got to make a decision on it. It's okay if I buy this? And he went, where did you get that? Well, I got it at the Marble Falls Art Gallery. This is the scene that him and his son would walk down that road. It was the very ranch that they would go deer hunting on. And he came out of his depression. Are y'all, do you understand what I'm saying? All of us in here can go much further than what our limitations are. Are you with me? Faith is the action. It's an action word that pleases God. It's an action word. See, but, but God sometimes, he's the mover of the faith. And what I mean by that, just like in this illustration of this painting, he cared for his son. So he, on a, a day, stopped a Jerry Rufin to make a painting to bring this guy out of his depression. And it was, the, again, the very place for him and his son. That's not coincidence. Are you with me? God is a mover of faith also, by the way. He will do things to bring us up and come up out of ourselves so that we're not in that limitation of where we're at, regardless of what it might be. So thank God that God is a mover of faith. And we know this because in scriptures, Jesus himself said, I don't do anything unless I see my father doing it first. So we, got, we know that God the Father is doing things in terms of faith on his end. Faith is an action word that pleases God. You know, if you took faith and put it in the center, it would have many different legs that would go out to represent what faith is doing in different categories. For instance, faith is also something that touches the kingdom of God. How do we know that? It's right there in the word. It says that the kingdom of God is advancing what? And who grabs a hold of it? Violent men. That word can be exchanged for men that have a violent faith. You can take another leg and you could have faith that's going to come and address sin in an area, address sin in a community and start stirring things up in the spiritual realm See, because God's got a purpose. God's not ambiguous. God's not out there running around and willy-nilly, you know, well, let's do this, well, let's do that. No, he has an intended purpose. And so faith 
is looking into the heart of God. Now, when I and when you came to the cross, Christ removed the lid off our lives. But as I stated earlier, even then, our faith has to be conditioned or challenged because we're still only jumping this high. Are you with me? When I was uh, in the seventh grade, because when I was called to preach, uh, every time I'd go up to go preach, I would have sweaty palms and and I had all this pressure on me and and uh, every word I had to read my all my sermons word for word because I was bound up. See, Christ doesn't want us to be bound up. Faith is free. Faith is something that expresses itself in terms of the heart of God. There's no limitations for that. So like myself, Sunday after Sunday when I'd go up and preach, teach is what I'd like to say, I would be all palm sweaty and all kind of bound up with fear and before I'd go up, I'd be in the bathroom wanting to throw up. I I had the dry heaves. It was horrible. Now, how do you know when something's demonic in your life? It is over the board. Are you with me? It's in an inordinate amount of something that's going on in your life. So everybody has a fear of public speaking, but (laughs) mine was demonic, not that I dissected it that and and looked at it that way, but because it was over the top. So I was on the front row after Sunday, I don't know how many Sundays it was, and I just said, God, you take this away from me. See, sometimes faith is is talking to our Father and saying, I can't express myself in the way you want me to express myself that would be a reflection of your heart. And so, Father, on that front row on that Sunday morning years ago, I was serious. I was dead serious. I was tired Sunday after Sunday going up there. I had all my sermons typed out word for word. And then I was bound by that. I would be up there and I I was terrified that I would miss a word. I was terrified that I would miss a paragraph. And then I would lose my place and I'd get all confused. And I remember one Sunday... I was up there and I grabbed my message off the desk and I got up there and I realized I grabbed the wrong sermon that was from last Sunday. (laughs) Well, I was like, oh my God. But I went on and gave, the good news was this, nobody remembered the sermon from last Sunday. (laughs) Are you with me? I pray to God that that won't be the case this Sunday. But so this was like going on. This was like a, a, I was being pushed through a keyhole, so to speak. I mean, I was really at a place I was sick and tired of. So I said, I told Father, I, I said, listen, take this away from me or change my vocation. I do not want to do this under these conditions. And all of a sudden, bam! It's going to speak to somebody. I can see in the spiritual realm. And I went back to the seventh grade. And in the seventh grade, my English teacher, Mrs. Bloodsworth, and she lived up to that name. Mrs. Bloodsworth. Who you got for you? Mrs. Bloodsworth. Oh, man, you're going to hate her. Anyway, 
you know how kids are in school. You know, who'd you get? Who, what teacher did you get? Well, she had an exercise in class that we'd go up and write a sentence. You were, all of you in here remember this. You would break it down. This is the noun, the verb, the adverb, and so forth. So she would give the sentence. So she called on me, and I went up to the chalkboard, and she said, Tommy wore a green shirt. So I wrote out, Tommy wore a green shirt. But I left R, the R out of shirt. Some of y'all are coming in slow freight. You'll get there. Coming in slow freight. That's okay. It'll hit you on the way home. And so everybody busted out laughing. I had a lid. I put a lid on my life. I'm going to show you how I did it. So, Mrs. Bloodsworth was laughing. The whole class was laughing. And this got around the whole school. The principal, they see me in the hallway and they start laughing, you know. <laughs> it's the one that wrote that. Up. <laughs> and I made a word vow. Are you listening? I will never be embarrassed publicly ever again. I'm in the seventh grade. Now, years later, I'm at a church service that I'm to teach, preach, and I'm sick and tired of doing it and didn't realize the reason why I was bound up and I had a lid on my life because of a word vow that I made way back in the seventh grade. And all of a sudden in the spirit, like Sesame Street, a big R came up and it crumbled. Remember Sesame Street, R. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, it's been a little R all this time. God doesn't want to live on your life. God doesn't want a lid on my life. God's in the business of taking the lid off of your life. Who said you can only jump this high? Now we're conditioned by word vows. Poor expectations of ourselves will put a limitation on us. Our culture even puts a limitation on us. Hath God said here we got the world telling us what God is and who he is and, well, he doesn't even exist. And we allow that cultural culture that's around us. See, we have a culture, it's called a kingdom culture. It's different than the world's culture. I'm not listening to the world. I'm going to listen to God and what he says I am and who we are. He has a kingdom here right now. We need to be awakened that he wants us as a people to advance the kingdom of God. We're not here saved waiting on the by and by to get into heaven. That's just alomo. That's the icing or the ice cream on the pie. But he's telling us now we are representatives of the kingdom of God now. Bad traditions can put a lid on you. Your parents and we parents, us, us parents, we can put limitations on people. Friends can do it. I know somebody that has uh, gotten some musical awards. His first girlfriend that he had, they went to a concert. Nobody knew who this guy was. And while they were in line waiting to get their ticket to go in to see Skinny Jeans up there on stage playing his guitar, she was, he was telling her, hey, 
one day I'm going to have a gold or a platinum record. Well, she laughed at him and said, you'll never do that because she was looking in the natural, not what was in him. Well, she, he dropped her and got somebody that believed in him. Did y'all hear what I just said? Yes. You know, Jesus believes in you. That's right. Amen. See, scripture says this. Renew your mind. Yes. Well, how do we renew our minds? That's the question. How do we do that? Mental exercises? Do we get in there and do the Rubik's Cube and... Oh, look, I finally got all the colors. I'm 95 years old, but I finally got everything to line up. How do you renew your mind? You renew your mind by faith because what you're doing, faith is replacing the opposite of faith. And faith is an action word. And it's, a, it's, it's, it's where you are acting upon what it is that you want to change. In Hebrews 11.1, 1, I'll wait for you to get there. I encourage you as a bishop or a bishop to you, to please have your Bible. It's the living logos. It's the word of God. It is alive. It's active. Sharper than a two-edged sword. Cutting down to the very bone and marrow of your life. Revealing the intentions and the thoughts of who we are. The word of God washes us. The word of God cleanses us. The word of God molds and shapes us and it's there for our benefit. And I want to encourage you to get in the word. Come to buy a Sunday school. I'm serious about this. Come to Tuesday night, Wednesday night. Come to these things. This is where you're going to get sharpened. Your character is going to get developed. I believe you're there. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it, the elders obtain a good testimony. I'm going to take one word out of this called substance. And I want to break it down. Because it says right there, now faith is what? So it'd be, it'd be good to kind of break that down and look at it and see it. Substance. This is the definition of it. That which has separate and independent existence. It means to stand firm or it is the essential nature of the heart. The substance of faith is what's in your heart. It's the, the essential nature of who you are. Forget about the outward trappings. Forget about what people are saying. Forget about the natural settings. What is in our hearts? Christ even said that. It was mentioned today about the heart. It's where the will is. It's where the intentions are seated at. I wake up you wake up every morning, what are we waking up to? Well, I got another crappy day at work. Or do we wake up and thank the Father? Do we get up and start praising Him and the Holy Spirit for being there? Asking the Holy Spirit to come and minister to us. Asking the Holy Spirit to reveal things. Asking the Holy Spirit to change us. Asking the Holy Spirit, hey, who is it that I can minister to today? Because the kingdom is touching. You see, faith has to touch Jesus. And if it doesn't touch Jesus, it's not faith. Did you hear what I just said?
If you love me, well, let's go to uh, John, I think it's John 14, 15. If that's not it, just listen to me. <laughs> if you love me, keep my commandments. Bill's going to look it up on his electronic device there. Is that right? Okay, thank you. And I will pray the Father. See, we got a poor image of fatherhood because how we've messed up family in this nation. The Father, our Father God, He cares about it. He loves us. Amen. Amen. And He will give you another helper. Who's going to give us another helper? The Father. Amen. And He may, that He may abide with you for How many of y'all accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior and even, you know, you've got the Holy Spirit in you and then, not as an ad deluxe addition to that, but I would encourage you to get baptized in the Holy Spirit. Yes. The Spirit of Truth. He's talking about the Holy Spirit. He's in you. The Spirit of Truth is in you. Whom the world cannot receive. The world doesn't understand what we're talking about. Because it neither sees him or knows him, but you know him. That word know is konosko. It means intimately. You have an intimate relationship. For he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you orphans. I will come to you. Notice that. That word orphans. That's an interesting word. I will, he told them. I mean, these are Christians. These are believers. I will not leave you as orphans. Hmm. Well, let's break down orphan. Orphan is late Latin. They got early, late, ecclesiastical Latin. There's all kinds of different, modern Latin. There's all kinds of different Latin, by the way. Here it is. In Latin, it's orphanus. It's to be deprived of free status. Let me read that again. It is to be deprived of free status. So when you, the lid's off, but if you still think you're an orphan, orphan, you're deprived of free status because you think you're deprived of free status. That's not who Christ says you are. He said, he who I set free is free in what? Indeed. But how many of us are still thinking, and I'm talking about religiously, that we're orphans? It's to be weak. Faith that's weak is not going to change anything. It's not going to change your life. It's not going to make the life of somebody else better. It also means to be parentless. Listen, we're not that. We got the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It means to be an orphan, it means hardship. To be an orphan, it means suffering. To be an orphan means there's trouble in your life. To be an orphan, it means that you are a slave. But Jesus said, I've set you free. And we have no longer, he has removed this from our lives, but because of word vows, culture, and other limitations in our lives because we receive these limitations, we have lessened our faith to represent the advancement of the kingdom of God. In our families, in our lives, and in our community, in our workplaces, in politics,
I mean, dang on. That fleet jumped out of there. He's heard my message. <laughs> That's, that sucker's gone. <laughs> is this speaking to anybody? This isn't Shakespeare. This is what Christ is saying about us. You know, faith, uh, Colossians 1.27, let's go there, and I'll, I'll start wrapping it up. Let me go there too so I get the words exactly right. 127, Colossians 127. Let me know when you're there. Say, I'm there. I'm there. Yeah, here we go. To them, to them, speaking to us, God will to make known what are the riches of the glory, talking about us, of this mystery among the Gentiles, still talking about us which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. You see, the hope of glory is in you. Now let me tell you what that means. That means hope of glory. Glory and hope together gives you an image. It gives you an image on the inside that touches God's heart and God is reflecting back to you an image of what he wants. He wants different things for different people at different times and different categories. Right? Faith is not going, I want a Cadillac, I want a Cadillac, I want a Cadillac, I want a Cadillac. That's not faith. Now, on the other hand, I'll say this. If you're moving in faith and loving God, you might be in a region. The only way you're going to reach these people if you drive a Cadillac. God can give you a Cadillac without you even asking. Yeah. Scripture says, seek ye first the kingdom of God. And what? Amen. You know, we have really, in the church, I'm saying, you know, we've cheapened faith a little bit. Are you with me? Faith is the hope of glory that's in you and me that is touching God so he can reflect an image back to us and he sees this image. It might be to feed the poor. It might, for you, might be you to start a ministry. It might be you to stop doing this. It might be something like, you know, whatever, you know, change your family. I don't know. But I do know this, it's going to be something that's going to advance the kingdom of God as a reflection of who he is. Which is love and peace and joy and patience. Of which the world needs, right? We, you know, we don't have to drum anything up, you know what I'm saying? We just walk, walk in freedom and saying, I'm not living, I'm jumping out. I'm kind of still amazed with that flea jumping out of there. I'm going to jump out of the jar. Amen. Just like that flea. Exactly. I'm not going to stay in that jar. I'm jumping out of my jar that I have allowed things to give me limitations. And the first limitation is this. I don't believe. I'll make my own terms. And God's going to jump to my calling. And that's not the way this works. It's us seeking him and loving others. Love the Lord thy God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. And likewise, love your neighbor. As yourself. Are you with me? You know the Ten Commandments, when they're, you know, they're not this legalistic thing, but it's there in terms of the heart. The heart has been changed and say the law is good. That's right. You know? 
So you're only under the law if you think you're not free. The law is crushing you. But if you're free, you're on top of the law. And you're saying, I want, I, I desire and I want to keep these laws because they're good. They're not bad. So there's a Russian, I'll give you an example of what I mean by being free. There's a Russian tale that there was a gentleman that had a vast land of territory and he had a gentleman working on it for years and he wanted a blessing. So he called uh, the peasant to him and he said, listen, as far as you can walk, this is, we're talking about a huge area. He said, as far as you can walk, Wherever your feet touch, I'm going to give you that land. So the peasant took off, and they found him dead three days later because he was covenanting to get more land. Thou shalt not covet. You know why? Because you're never going to get enough. That's just one of the Ten Commandments. See how practical that is? Reasonable it is. And it's good. I feel like singing a song, but I don't have any I don't have any vocal cords, you know. The hope of glory. That's it's in you, it's in me, and that glory that's in us is wanting to reach out above the lid to touch Jesus to get a reflection of an image that comes back that gives us a representation of what his heart wants that's faith let me give you an example a practical example there's a couple, they want to start a restaurant. But their motive for starting a restaurant is so they can represent the kingdom of God and be an influence in the city and be able to minister to people that come in and go out. And it wasn't there. But through seeking how to minister and the gift was put, the image was put there. Most of the time, it's usually with the wife. <laughs> and then it becomes a very big success. And every, not only the people in the community, but around know about it and they come. And they don't own a restaurant. They're not restaurant owners. They're ministers of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Are you with me? The hope, the glory will touch Jesus and reflect an image back to you to give you a seed form so that your faith, because faith without works is what? Dead but gives you a seed form for you to act on that and start believing that the substance of things not yet seen. In other words, materialize the substance. The essential part and the nature of somebody's heart. Amen? Amen. See, Jesus is wanting to touch every one of us. Amen. Faith has got to touch him. You remember the lady with the issue of blood? And she was an outcast. She was a Gentile. And it was a big throng of people. Correct? But most of them were men, of course. But she had to push through. And I don't know how this lady did it, but she pushed through. She kept thinking, if I can only touch him. If I can only touch the hem of his garment, I'll be healed. If I can only touch him. And this says that she already 
uh, wasted all of her money on doctors to get healed. Nobody could do anything. So the lady touched her, and this is amazing to me. Jesus stops and says, who touched me? And he said, virtue has come out of me. You know, when you touch Jesus, virtue comes out of him and comes to us. And the disciples, right? When they say, what are you talking about, Jesus? There's people, all kinds of people are touching you. No! Somebody has touched me. Virtue has left me. So you can touch Jesus and nothing, nothing. Cold meat. (laughs) Or you can touch him and virtue will come to you. Who needs faith? Who wants faith? Who wants to jump out of the jar? Who is wanting to see the hope of glory in you to get the reflection by touching Jesus of what it is that he's wanting to do for you and your family and also in this church and in this community and beyond. Don't put limitations on our church. Are you? Let Christ, the hope of glory that's within you, let you jump out of the, I don't care if you're a single mom, I don't care if you're unemployed, I don't care what it is that you're going through. Christ is bigger than your situation. He's a deliverer. He's a deliverer. <laughs> Aren't you glad he's delivered us? He's delivered us from our sins for what purpose? So we can be that reflection of the kingdom of God. You remember the Bible story? We just went over this in our our Tuesday night. And Jesus sitting at the table with all of his disciples. And, you know, they sitting there and got a big loaf of bread on the table. They've been cutting it up, eating pieces of that bread, Talking shop, you know, it's what most ministers do. Crumbs are on the table, and you can imagine the scene. Knife laying there and crumbs on the table, and some of the crumbs are around the table. And this Phoenician woman, Syro-Phoenician woman, comes up and says, Master, first of all, as you know, in that culture, see, she jumped out of the jar because her culture told her you're not supposed to go speak to men. You're not supposed to go, you know, and approach the Messiah. You're not supposed to go approach the Roboni, the master teacher as Jesus was. You're not supposed to do that as a woman. If you do that, woo, man, that was cultural. That's there. It's it's, It's the truth. But she didn't care about culture and the limitations that were put on her Her child was at home suffering. And when there is something that's there that's a mover for your faith, you don't really care anymore about all that kind of stuff. You're going to go. So she approached Jesus and said, Jesus, and I think Jesus and her had a little mouse, cat and mouse game going on with one another, my opinion. And the disciples sitting around there, who is this woman that's coming up here to talk? You know, who is this? And Jesus answered, started having this conversation with this lady. The little lady says, I have, can, you come, can you heal my daughter? She's, got, she's demon-possessed. She's, Jesus says, the bread is for Israel alone. Another limitation. But Jesus was testing her faith. Mm -hmm. He's even going to test it even harder. Because she goes, uh, oh, let me back up. Jesus said, what do we have to do with dogs? Jesus just called her a dog. (laughs) Really? But I think he had a gleam in his eye, a little sparkle. 
she could pick up on it and they were kind of joking with one another and the fleas that were sitting around there, the 12 fleas, they didn't have a clue what was going on. Are you with me? I'm not saying that disrespectfully. And he's, she says this, yes, master, but even the dogs eat the crumbs from the master's table. Go. Your faith, she just touched him. Your faith has made her whole. Go home. And she went home that very hour. The daughter was in her right mind. 